Good evening or good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. And welcome uh, to our United for Ukraine events. As you know, unfortunately, Russia's war on Ukraine is still going on. And so it's very important that we continue to be united for Ukraine. And we start this meeting, this gathering every week by standing for the Ukrainian national anthem. And uh, this week we'd like to play a version of the national anthem sung by a, a young girl. So it's still powerful. So if you would please join and stand with us for the Ukrainian national anthem. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, and welcome once again. My name is Yemi Babintin Ashai. I lead United People Global as the president. And it's a privilege to be with you today, although it's a sad occasion, because this war is still going on. Now, we start this gathering every time from listening to voices from around the world before we then transition to listening to our Ukrainian brothers and sisters. And very often there is a specific focus for the day, which we do together. So we would like to start as we do um, by giving a chance for anybody here to share, whether you've been here before, it's your first time. If you have any thoughts on your mind or a question on your mind, we can take a few hands before we continue. So please use the Zoom application and raise your hand if there's anything you would like to share. Uh, from me, while we wait for a hand, I'm, I'm still very sad about this. I, we brought today a speech by the Ukrainian president where he's addressed the United Nations Security Council. So it's an extract of the speech, it's very short. So if you wanna see it, we will play that during today's event. Um, and I just continue to be saddened by the fact that the world is watching and not doing enough. The Ukrainian president said that the UN should shut down if it cannot do more than watch. And I think many of us agree, I do. Um, also part of what most people will say is the problem is that on the Security Council, Russia has a veto. Now, in almost every other institution on the planet, if a top leader or executive is being investigated for something, they are usually suspended, right? They usually can't wield the power or influence they have to veto anything. So why on earth is the UN Security Council an example of bad governance? So they can't act because the person they suspect of doing something bad has a veto. I mean, human beings are more intelligent than this. This is not an obstacle. This is evidence of lack of courage. All right, those were just two cents for me. Please raise your hand if you want to share anything, how you're feeling. Yvonne, thank you, Yvonne. You've got the microphone, please. 
Yes, I'm Yvonne, and uh, as you said, I'm not fear. I'm sad for this is still happening. In the morning, I was thinking what we can do as a united the global, how we can help our sisters and the brothers there. Can we go there and put the voice or what we can do for them? Then in my heart, another heart said, no, nothing you can do because the war is now progressive, progressive. But we can still talk on the social medias and help the sisters and the brother there. If they can manage, like, it's hard to go outside to talk about it, to against the war. But we can still try and everyone must think and think. I know it's hard to to do these things or to avoid it. But also there is something we can do in terms of like social activists, social medias, talk about it, meetings. I don't know how my friend uh, think about it, but on my side, I can't go there to fight, to help Ukrainian sisters and brothers. But um, we are sitting here to help each other in terms of standing together and still think about it together yes. and try to bring the, the peace together if we, even it's difficult. But let's still think about what we can do. You know, it's hard. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you Yvonne. You're speaking for many of us, it's not easy. And I want to underscore something Yvonne said. By being here, we are doing something. Even if it's just creating a space where we can share our grief together, that's something. Even if it's just a space where we can ask questions, that's something. Um, again, I'd like another hand. Anyone, especially those who are not from Ukraine, how are you feeling? What's on your mind? Anything on any question that you're coming into this conversation with, or are you just are you just here to support? Just we'd like to hear one or two more voices, and then we will move on. Ben, thank you. Anybody else can use the Zoom application and raise your hand just to share a few words before we continue. Thank you, Yvonne. Again, Ben, you've got the mic. Yeah. First, I just wanted to say, obviously, my thoughts and prayers. Um, the headlines of every single newspaper around the world, I would say, is focused on what's happened, um, which is beyond words. Uh, there's, I, I said to Danka last night, I don't think there's any words I could use to, to, to even slightly comfort what, what happened. It's, it's one of those moments where you just, you're stunned to silence um, and the pictures are just, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's horrible. But I think the reason why we're all here today um, I think it's perfectly encapsulated um, by an Abraham Lincoln quote, which is, um, I'd rather be a little nobody than to be an evil somebody, which en encapsulates the fact that Putin might be somebody, but he's evil. And we might, we might not be on the front lines of Ukraine, but we're doing something, we're doing good. Um, so that's just what I wanted to start off today with. Uh, so thanks for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ben. All right. I think that it's maybe we transition and I can invite our Ukrainian family to please unmute and tell us how would you like to proceed today? Do you want to speak first? Would you like to invite somebody else? What's, what's on your mind? Yeah, actually, thank you everyone who come. I could shortly tell the agenda. As usual, we prepared short presentation with uh, some short video. And then we have like two speakers. Um, one, uh, no, both of them are from Mariupol. And I guess most of you know about Mariupol and what happened in Mariupol. And actually then uh, later they'll they will share own experience, yeah. All right, thank you so much. 
Thank you. Would so you, you can proceed. Yeah, so could we go? Yeah. Yes, you can. Yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> I will be sharing, and Alexandra will be the first. One moment, just sharing my screen. Um, well, welcome again, and thank you again, everybody, for being here. Just your presence matters. So thank you. Uh, could you see my screen? Yes, we can, although it's not yet in projection mode. Okay, that looks correct. Yeah. Uh, hello, everybody. Yemi, please uh, tell me if everything okay with my sound. Yeah, thank you. Sound, visual, everything is good. Thank you. Uh, today uh, event uh, for me, I, I guess it will be the hardest one because uh, um, on Sunday when we uh, found when when first news about Bucha appears, I can say that the whole world world was shaken by this news and. Um, Today we we want to tell you about this about this Bucha massacre and this hashtag is popular now and even uh, social media uh, blog uh, posts with this hashtag as the uh, uh, social media thinks thinks uh, this is a violent content. Uh, Danka, please next slide. Uh, we put on the next slide uh, uh, titles uh, of the press in the whole world, and I will read only a few titles. Mother shoot with her baby in the car. Over 400 bodies of armless civil people are found on the street and in the mass grave. Girls under 10 years old are raped by Russian soldiers. They played hunting safari with Ukrainian kids, told them to run and shoot them in the legs. Bodies of women raped and killed are left on the streets naked. And many other titles. It's If you didn't know what hell is, I guess the hell was in Bucha. Uh, I just, I guess, I believe many people don't know, uh, didn't know about this, about Bucha. Uh, and this was one of the most beautiful city near the Kiev. Irpin and Bucha were those towns where many Kiev civilian, Kiev, uh, Kiev citizens wanted to buy home. There were there was as beautiful with many parks. That was very beautiful town. And now there are hundreds buried in mass grave. Russian killed civilians just for fun. They killed mothers with children on their hands who wanted to escape. They shoot in their backs when, when they wanted to escape. This so-called Russian army raped women repeatedly. They raped mothers. They raped girls in front of their parents. They raped children. When our soldiers came in town, they found bodies of little girls who were even not 10 years old with turn vaginas. I can... I can assure you that we won't forgive this, this things. I, I don't know what the word to use. Every photo from Bucha is banned, as I told you, on social, on social media. And I guess this is because this happening because you, you cannot unsee Bucha. If you see it once, you won't forget it. And uh, for us, this war is divided on before Bucha and after Bucha, because after this, many, no, I, not many, nobody can say that they didn't know. They can't pretend no more they, that they didn't know. And uh, 
uh, on previous event, I told you that uh, the more people will be evacuated from occupied cities and towns, the more horrible stories we will hear. And this story is one of this. This is one of these stories. It's hard to, to say, it's, it's hard to speak. And we found one uh, short video with few uh, photos. Uh, but I, I can assure you that, well, uh, many people who were in fact in Bucha, uh, they, they say that uh, in reality, everything is much worse and we can't even imagine what happened there from this photo. But still, we want you to see this. Danke, please. Do you like... No, we can... Uh, do no, you hear no sound. the sound? Okay, no. one moment. I'm so sorry for that. Uh, maybe it's like... You may need to start sharing again. Okay. Okay, I'm so sorry. It's okay, um, stop. No, 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 nothing's wrong uh, there. Just... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well done, I said I put... Well, okay, actually, well, well I put share. Okay, share. Well done, guys. When you share the screen... Yeah, 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 I put this, like, but I don't know, maybe something with my laptop. Let's try it again. Can you hear it on your side? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm so sorry. If you send me the link, I can share it, okay? Okay, okay. One moment, hear me. Okay, during this pause, little, I... I just want to add that living these towns, uh, Russian soldiers stole everything they could steal, everything, even, even underwear, washing machines, they, they stole everything. And uh, we uh, heard the, the I, I don't know how to translate, uh, girls, uh, intercepted conversation. Oh, thank you, Yura. Uh, we heard uh, Russian soldiers uh, spoke with their wives and wives asked them to bring some clothes and laptops for their children. Can you believe it? <laughs> so it's not just Russian, Russian soldiers, it's, it's their wives. It's not Putin who raped our Ukrainian women. It's Russians. So Anka, do you have the link? Sure, because I did uh, so maybe this was the problem. Okay. The entire Kyiv region. Do you hear? Yes. Okay, so from the beginning. <sighs> Ukrainian forces have retaken the entire Kyiv region. But Russia's retreat comes at a high price. Northwest of the capital, the city of Bucha, bears witness to the brutality of war. At least 20 people in civilian clothes left dead in the street. Each seen a grim snapshot of the chaos and violence of their final moments. Ukrainians say at the hands of Russian forces. Days earlier, the mayor of Bucha announced the liberation of his town. March the 31st will go down in the history of our community as the day of liberation. The liberation of our armed forces of Ukraine from Russian occupiers. So today I state that this day is joyful joyful and this is a great victory in the Kyiv region and we will definitely wait until there is a great victory all over Ukraine. The joys of victory soon dampened by death. Ukraine's general staff is warning Bucha residents Russian forces mined the city before they left, 
Combat engineers work to clear suspected mined areas. Bodies remain where they fell until it's safe to retrieve them. Bucha's mayor says entire families were killed and nearly 300 people have been buried in a mass grave. Not far from Bucha, in the village of Dmitrivka, west of Kyiv, the remains of Russian soldiers killed in fierce fighting there, left in the street. In the north of the country, the occupiers continue to retreat, slowly but noticeably. In the east, the situation remains extremely difficult. Russian troops are moving to Donbass and towards Kharkiv. They are preparing new strikes. We are preparing an ever more active defense. As Ukrainians begin to occupy and clear recaptured areas, what happened in Bucha, Ukrainians fear, could be the first of many instances of communities shattered by this war. Zain Basravi, Al Jazeera, Lviv. Yeah. Shall we this end? Thank you, Danke. And thank you, Alexandra. Um, it is just shocking, awful, no real words can describe it. And I just want to encourage people here um, to acknowledge the courage that our Ukrainian sisters here are showing, because as much as we try to empathize and stand with Ukraine, and it's hard for us to see this, but imagine them. This is their country. This, these are their, their actual people. So thank you for the courage with which you are doing what you're doing. And for anybody watching this, wherever you are, please go all the way with the empathy. Let's not look at these pictures like it's somebody else. These are our brothers and sisters. This is our shared humanity. Someone is doing this to our people. Um, back to you, Alexandra and Danka. Thank you, Yemi. Thank you for your words. And actually, uh, I would like to uh, Nata to continue and she will tell uh, us how Russian authorities uh, wanted to hide that uh, the Russian army did did all those terrible things. Nata, please, the floor is yours. Uh, yes, thank you, Alexandra. Thank you, Yemi. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today and for giving us the words and the um, possibility to speak about this. So what you can see on the, our screen, uh, on the left side, it's a screenshot from the Facebook page of the Ministry of Defense of Russia and uh, about the post on the Facebook, which they made approximately the same time, yes, when these pictures started appearing in social media, in other, other media, not only in Ukraine, I mean, all over the world, but they trying to say that it's like wrong, that we are lying again. And uh, to be honest, when we were preparing this presentation, all of us, yes, I just check it by myself today. I just went to this page, to the Facebook page, because in the presentation we have there even the link to it. And I check it and it's still there. I mean, it's still on the Facebook, their opinion, yes, uh, how they see it. And uh, what they are saying, like it's translated into English, what you can see on the left uh, side on the screen, but actually it's written in Russian on their Facebook page. And what I saw, they have it like, mostly in Russian language, but sometimes they have it bilingual, yes, so people can also read it in English. And uh, yes, yeah, they'd say that it's a provocation from our side and the provocation from our Ukrainian authorities uh, and as they call it, our Western sponsors. So they call like European Union as our Western sponsor um, that help us spreading the lie, yes, which we are spreading. And uh, they say that this propaganda of our videos and of our pictures that um, they appeared like long time ago before the Russian troops were in Bucha and it is our fault and the fault of our army and that we did it by ourselves. And uh, actually, this is, you can see uh, on the picture, yes, like the Russian Defense Ministry doesn't recognize the atrocity of its military in Bucha. 
And uh, on the right uh, picture, which you can see also from the satellite, uh, it's uh, actually we had this information from the New York Times that they published these satellite pictures and they confirmed that the bodies appears there during the time when the city was controlled by the terrorists. So like, again, there is a big lie of uh, Russian government and even in such terrific situation and in such uh, horrible times. And um, again, like we're trying to prove everything, yes, and uh, to see that uh, it's lie and just to show to the whole world that we are saying the truth, yes, and even if some information occurs, we understand that it's also the war of information. Unfortunately, it's still here, yes, so still the world needs to know the truth, but you can see how they defend like their own opinion, yes, how that they're right. And then, Danka, please go to the next slide. Uh, there is another like video again from the New York Times. And this is the video from the aerial footage, uh, which was uh, recorded. Danka, can you hear me? Uh, ah, okay, you will show this video. Okay, but I will shortly describe what it was. It's very short. It even doesn't have a sound. But again, it was recorded by Ukrainian military forces in early March when Russian forces were in the town and how they were shooting uh, civilians from their tanks. Yeah, so you will see the man um, which were approaching by his bicycle on the street and there was a tank, yes, and they were just shooting civilians and again, like, it's just a real video. So, and again, it's an article in New York Times. So, Danka, please share this video. Sorry for network. Maybe I will send link uh, not for you or for someone because it seems that I have bad. Uh, so sorry for that. I will share. Let's. Oh, yet. Danka, maybe you can share it with Yemi because I'm here yeah, for my because, iPad. I'm not uh, sure I'm able to share any videos here. Like I have my limited uh, rights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, it seems that I don't know. Uh, are you hear me? It seems yes. That I am going like I could. Uh, no, no, we can hear you. We can see you. Yeah. But uh, yes, yes. I'm not sure I will be able to share it from my iPad. Uh, so I'm just. Um, Put the link in chat and or like yeah, this, put yeah. your share. Mm -hmm. It's like okay. the article from New York Times. Sorry, there are all these uh, subscribed to New York Times requirements. Yeah, I guess not uh, described uh, what, what what has happened on the on that video. So she, she told everything they shoot from. Ten. Is there any sound on the video? No. Just like click no. in video. No, there is uh, no, 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 sound. no. Just click in video on full screen and. Can you see it? Yes.
Yeah, that's it. Thank you, Yemi. It was a very short one, but actually it was just like proving for my words. Like, yes, it was just one episode which you saw on the video and uh, which were filmed, yes, by the camera. But there were like uh, so many, uh, unfortunately, cases like that happening on the streets of Bucha, Irpin, Gustomel and uh, other small cities on the west western and north, north part of Kiev region. So actually, from my side, that's it. Thank you so much. We are trying to be very short today because we want to give more time to our guests. But I'm giving my uh, words to Oksana. Thank you. Thank you, Nata. Thank you, Nata. Hello, everyone. I'm going to continue our short presentation with uh, giving you an idea what is the position of Russia towards the horror they created in Ukraine. Here is the article recently published in one of the biggest Russian state-owned news agencies, RIA News, uh, titled What Russia Has to Do with Ukraine. You can find the link to the whole article uh, on the slide, uh, while I will read you just a couple of quotations from there. Back in April last year, we wrote about the inevitability of denazification of Ukraine. We do not need Nazi Ukraine as an enemy of Russia and an instrument of the West. Today, the issue of denazification has moved into practical plane. The name Ukraine apparently cannot be retained as a name of fully denazified public entity liberated from the Nazi regime. Ukrainism is an artificial anti-Russian construction that doesn't have its own civilization content, a subordinate element of an enemy and an enemy of civilization. Therefore, the denazification of Ukraine is also its inevitable de-Europeization. All armed Nazi formation, including the armed forces of Ukraine and military informational and educational infrastructure that endures the activity, have to be eliminated. Still, a significant part of population, which is passive Nazis, is also guilty. They supported Nazi power. Fair punishment for this part of population is also possible as bearing the inevitable hardships of a just war against the Nazi system conducted with the care towards civilians. Further denazification of the masses consists in re-education, which is achieved by ideological repression, suppression of Nazi attitudes and strict censorship, not only in political sphere, but necessarily also in the sphere of culture and education. It is quite difficult to comment it. As you see, this is the position of Russia towards Ukraine and Ukrainians. And this is what they mean by denazification, or should we call it genocide? They do not even try to conceal it anymore as they did before. This is the result of impunity and it will get worse if the world stays silent. And uh, now I'm giving the floor to my colleague. Thank you, Oksana. I think I can go, I suppose. Um, everything will be okay with my internet connection. Actually, we decided to uh, tell you about um, killed children because it's always important. And I, I guess you remember our first meeting, uh, it was like uh, 60, if I'm not mistaken, plus children. Uh, now Russia killed 165 children and um, 266 children are actually now injected. And it's like, was uh, more than months of uh, Russia invasion in Ukraine. Um, Alexa, maybe next slide. And as always, we want to show you the slide about how you could support Ukraine. Uh, it's you could do like similar steps, like just post in your social media um, information. Uh, about what is happening in Ukraine, like just do not buy Russia products or goods, um, email your local politicals, and also we gaze at, um, I guess, in the right, uh, in the left part uh, side, you could see useful links. Um, 
please just uh, after our presentation um like i will send you um uh, like a link to whole presentation just click on these links as i really is like real useful resources for example the first one help um you, you are now it's resources with some list of organizations both like bigger and smaller um when you could when you could like um choose organization and donate of course goodwill wow which actually initiated with uh, upg and there you could find ukrainian education platform it's NGO who helps uh, civilians in this war um yeah also um i'm i think this one is so important because there is like information for post in uh, 31 language, 31 language you, I guess, could find your language and download information and share. Yeah, thank you, Alexa, not only in English, but in your local language information, what is happening in Ukraine. And this is the next slide. Um, actually, it's about donation and um you know many people could think oh i want to help uh, ukraine i want to donate how i can help um it's like we call you all all our upg ukrainian community if you don't know where to donate uh we call you to donate to ukrainian army uh why this is so important uh because um guys now the ukrainian army fight with the um like second oh, sorry fight against the second army of the world with russian army and um if uh, you we don't support our army um like there will be more uh these cases uh which we see uh, which we see in butcher now there will be more modern uh could be so it could be more modded people more um wanted people and here is like some resources like um NGO, the return alive foundation and also <clears throat> the national bank of ukraine has own account and you could donate arm uh, to our army and the last one um uh, for now it's just like image just like nothing, just icon. Um, but there is like sentence here could be a, a logo of your initiative. So, um, we understand that we are not like millions of billions, and you like can't continuously like give all your money for Ukrainians. Uh, but you uh, could make some steps or, for example, organize like campaign in your country and collect money uh, for Ukrainians. For example, my friends from Ukraine, they uh, collect books uh, from like usual Ukrainians and then um, each of uh, Ukrainians uh, could buy this book by donating to the Ukrainian army. You could do, I don't know, like um, um, uh, selling like the cookies or organize some charity initiative. Just do like little steps, little campaigns, but support us. And from me, it. Um, uh, it's all from me and Alexa, you go. Thank you, Danka. Thank you, Danka. And finally, uh, Yemi, we go to our speakers. Uh, actually, we uh, uh, spoke about Bucha uh, today, and uh, uh, the next city is Mariupol. Uh, we we uh, heard about it that you heard about this a lot from us on every meeting and today we have uh, two speakers from uh, Mariu mariupol and um, as i as i told you the more um, uh, cities uh, or towns will be will free from 
Russian occupation, the more terrible things we will know. And uh, we, we have the information that a Russian army uh, 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 took with them uh, portable crematorius, I believe I said right. We thought uh, that this was for the uh, uh, soldiers, as they, uh, as Russian army, don't do, doesn't doesn't prefer to take their bodies with them. Uh, but now we believe uh, they will try to hide uh, the consequences of the uh, uh, of of the thing they done uh, in our cities. Uh, I hope I, I hope I'm wrong, but uh, now we have our speakers, Anna or Yuri, who, who would like to start. All right, thank you very much. So both of them are from Mariupol. Yes. All right, so Anna, Yuri, you're welcome. If we can please. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Welcome. Uh, okay. um, if we can I just will... show them some love for being here. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we hope hello. that you are somewhere safe now. Uh, yes, I'm uh, in safety place. And um, I will be speak um, in Ukrainian because it would be easier for me. And I hope uh, girls uh, will help me with translation. Um, 16 березня я uh, дивом виїхала uh, з пекла під назвою Маріуполь. On the 16th of March, uh, just but by by being lucky, I got out from the hell, which is called Mariupol. Але зараз там знаходяться дуже багато людей, які залишилися і які не можуть виїхати. But now there are still so many people who are left there and who cannot get out of the city. І тому про Маріуполь треба кричати на весь світ, щоб якось спасти, врятувати цих людей. And that is why uh, you have to shout uh, to the whole world about Mariupol to help those people, to save those people, to save Mariupol. Спочатку я хочу розказати взагалі, як все почалося і Я думаю, Юрій мене зможе доповнювати, тому що ми опинилися в однаковій ситуації. So, um, at the beginning, I want to tell you how it all started, and I hope that Yuri will support me and uh, in my speech, because uh, we, we, are, we were kind of in the same situation. Uh, 24 числа, коли в Україні почалася війна, uh, в Маріуполі було більш-менш спокійно. So on the 24th of February, when the full-scale war in Ukraine started, uh, Mariupol was kind of safe and a calm place. Перш за все, я маю на увазі серед настроїв людей. Був такий більш-менш спокій. Uh, so by this, I also mean that people were uh, calm in the in the in the city. So there were no people who were panicking or. У нас була можливість виїхати з Маріуполя. У нас були евакуаційні поїзди, автобуси, та можна було виїхати власним транспортом. Але більшість не захотіла. So we could have gone out of Mariupol, there were evocational trains, buses, you could have easily gone by your own transport, but most of people didn't want to go anywhere. Але чому? Як би це страшно не звучало, ми звикли чути вибухи та постріли за вісім років війни на Донбасі. Uh, but why would you think? Um, well, how strangely it wouldn't sound? Uh, we got accustomed to hearing explosions and missile attacks um, during the eight years uh, of the war on Donbass. And on the 24th of числа and actually on the beginning of the war, we also heard all these attacks and attacks, but we understood that they were not so close to us. And on the 24th of, uh, of February and then um, a little bit later, in a couple of days, we still heard those explosions, we still heard the attacks, but they were not that close to our city. 
Але люди навіть не могли собі уявити, що у 21-му сторіччі може відбуватися таке з розвиненим містом. People would not even imagine and would not even believe that something like this could happen in the, the, in the 21st century was, the, was a pretty developed city. Але вже 2 березня ми почали жалкувати, що не виїхали. І зараз поясню, чому. But already on the 2nd of March... Uh... I cannot translate this word, Shalkovate. Girls, could you help we me? Sta- regret. Yeah, regret. We started, yeah, we started to regret uh, that uh, we, we did not get out of the city. And I can uh, tell why. So, uh, in these days, uh, it was already not possible to get out of the city, and moreover, we were cut off the heat, water, um, uh, we, we, and we didn't get any mobile, mobile network, we didn't have any mobile network. Uh, Тобто у нас був холод, у нас не було можливості зв'язатися з нашими рідними і взагалі дізнатися ситуацію по місту і по країні. Uh, which means that uh, it was very cold in our houses uh, and we couldn't, uh, we couldn't connect with our, uh, with our family, we could not understand what's going on in the city, what's going on in the country in general. Десь 3 або 4 березня вже відключили газ, і ми були змушені готувати на дворі на вогнищі. So on, on the 3rd of March uh, we got cut off the gas and then we had to uh, cook food uh, outside on the fire. А так як не було води, ми були дуже щасливі, коли випадав сніг, тому що ми могли набрати сніг і використовувати його, щоб, наприклад, помити посуд. So as, as there was uh, no, uh, no water, uh, we were happy and we were glad when we had the snow outside, because that meant that basically we could gather the snow in a bucket or somewhere. And then we can have water to, for example, wash our dishes. Але коли не було снігу, ми набрали воду з радіаторів, тобто з трупу для опалення будинків. And when there was no snow, uh, we, uh, we gathered, we collected water from the radiators, uh, from the pipes uh, which hit the houses. А, але будемо чесними, в таких о, умовах можна було б вижити е, і прожити певний період часу, тому що е, багато сторіч тому люди так жили. But let's be honest, uh, it, w- it was possible to live in such conditions um, for, for, for a certain period of time, because uh, people in, in, the, in the previous centuries lived like this. Але у той же самий час нас постійно бомбардував літак. Він літав над нами і скидав свої бомби. But at the same time we were shelled uh, by the bombs constantly. There were uh, the planes which bombarded us. А також постійно летіли снаряди з різних видів Um, зброї, такі як uh, гради, uh, смерчі і таке інше, і uh, снаряди від, від них um, попадали uh, по житлових будинках, дворах, машинах і так далі. And there were also constant missile attacks uh, from Graz, uh, Smerch, I'm not sure how to translate it, and if it is translated or not, but those are different kinds of um, armory. Russian armory, 
and uh, of, of course those uh, missiles um, fell fell on the um, cars, on the houses, and in the uh, playgrounds. Я могла вийти на вулицю, поставити к собі гріти чай на вогнище і дві секунди. I guess we lost the connection. Аня, можеш повторити? Could you please repeat? Окей. Наприклад, я могла вийти на двір погріти собі чаю на вогнищі. І тут я могла почути дві секунди свисту і вибух десь поруч. Це летів снаряд. So, uh, for instance, I was going out, uh, I went outside to uh, make some hot tea on the fire and literally two seconds, uh, I've, I've heard two seconds, um, whistle for two seconds, and then there was explosion somewhere nearby. Снаряди потрапляли у сусідні будинки, у дахи сусідніх будинків, десь поблизу, і ми не знали, куди знаряд паде наступного разу. The missiles were falling on the neighboring rooftop, on the neighboring houses' rooftops, and we we could not understand it. We could not know where they will fall next. Але мені пощастило, тому що мій будинок знаходиться у відносно безпечному районі. І коли я виїхала з Маріуполя, він був ще цілий. Наразі я не знаю. But I can consider myself as a lucky person, because my house was in a more or less safe district. That that's just my remark, but I cannot understand how anything can be safe in Mariupol. Um, and uh, uh, at the time I went out of Mariupol, it was um, still um, like it, it was still wholesome, uh, but it was it, it wasn't uh, shot by a missile. But uh, of course, I don't know what's going on with it now. Тому що зв'язку з Маріуполем ще досі немає взагалі. Because there is still no uh, network, no connection with Mariupol. Um, страшніше знаряду uh, – це, звичайно, літак. Mm. Uh, Тому so що… Mm -hmm. what, what is worse than the missile is, is the, uh, the plane? Um, з 2014 року над Маріуполем вже не літали літаки, тому ми не звикли чути кул літака. Так, з 2014 року не було літаків, які літали над Маріуполем, але дуже близько до місця, де війна була. And uh, they were very unused to hear um, the sounds of the plane. Тому що десь протягом 15 секунд ми чуємо цей гул. Ми чуємо, що він пролітає десь над нами, а потім бах, взрив, і ми розуміємо, що кудись ця бомба потрапила. Uh, so, uh, because we, we heard when the plane was flying above us, and then in, in literally 15 seconds, uh, we heard that it was the explosion, and we understood that somewhere bomb fell, but we didn't know where. І ми не могли бути впевненими, що через годину, через 15 хвилин ця бомба не впаде на нас. And we couldn't be sure at all that in 15 minutes or in an hour, the same bomb, bomb would not uh, fall um, on us. Ви зараз всі бачили фото та відео з Бучі, але я можу вас 
запевнити, що коли у Маріуполі з'явиться зв'язок, виявиться, що ситуація там як мінімум в 10 разів страшніша. Uh, you have all now seen the, the photos and uh, videos from Bucha, uh, Bucha, but I can assure you that when uh, there will be a network in Mariupol, where there will be any connection, uh, the, uh, the photos and videos and the footage will be at least 10 times worse than you have seen right now. Um. Те, що я вам зараз розповіла про своє життя ці, в ці 14 днів, це дуже щасливе життя, можна так сказати, тому що це подякувати моєму, моєї локації, тобто я була в більш-менш безпечному районі, і я... Впевнена, я вже знаю, що є історії набагато страшніше, ніж моя, і, але ми зможемо їх всі почути тільки коли буде зв'язок який-небудь. Я, моя історія була, і може бути вважається як щасливим, вважаючи до моєї локації, де я залишив це, але я впевнена, що ви Would, uh, you will hear and you could have heard already uh, much worse stories uh, from Mariupol uh, at, at this time. And when, when the network will return, uh, there will be much, much worse stories. And uh, now, as far as I know, the situation is still worse. And there are people who... У більш гірших умовах зараз там, наприклад, знаряди потрапляли до квартир або ще щось, і люди змушені бути весь час у підвалах і навіть не мають можливості вийти там на вулицю, погріти собі їсти. І так. I know that the situation is much worse right now there. Uh, and that people are living in much harsher uh, conditions. Uh, some, some of the people um, have seen the missile attacks and they basically, some, some people in Mariupol have to live constantly uh, in the basements, in the bomb shelters, having no uh, means and no chance to even get outside to uh, hit the food. И уже частина российских войск зайняла майже весь Маріуполь, наскільки я знаю. І уявіть собі, якщо ці солдати, що ці солдати наробили у маленькій бучі за доволі таки невеликий проміжок часу, що вони роблять зараз у Маріуполі? Просто уявіть. So just... Just imagine, uh, so yeah, the thing is that uh, Russian army has already occupied uh, quite a big territory of Mariupol. And Mariupol is a very large city with a population of 400,000 people, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. um, and a, just, just imagine what, what could we have done already and what are they doing right now there? Uh, if, 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 to, if to see what they have done in Bucha, then it's just imagine what they are doing in Mariupol right now. І я можу сказати, що наразі моє місто вже повністю зруйновано, і життя тисяч людей, долі тисяч людей теж. За останніми даними, приблизно 20 тисяч загиблих. От. So um, I can I can assure you that uh, the, my my city is already destroyed. It's already fully destroyed. The uh, the lives and the fates of thousands of people are fully destroyed as well. And according to the last stats, uh, around twenty thousand people are dead. Um, and um, Mariupol. Uh потребує уваги, щоб е, зробили хоч щось, е, закрили небо або е, відкрили офіційні гуманітарні е, коридори, щоб завести 
цю гуманітарну допомогу та вивезти автобусами людей до безпечного міста, зробити хоч щось, щоб врятувати життя цих, цих людей, що залишилося. And the attention, the worldwide attention to Mariupol is needed to, to, to do something, to make the world do something, to close the sky or to uh, open the humanitarian corridors to let the humanitarian aid in and people, civilians out of the city. А, і я вже дуже багато розказала, і, а, мабуть, Юрі не має чого доповнити, але я думаю, що а, ти можеш розказати а, про те, як а, виїхав з міста, тому що я знаю, що ти теж з пригодами виїжджав, і може щось а, а, про те, як ховали людей в братніх могилах та як армія намагається наша тримати місто. Я не знаю, тому що я дуже багато розказала інформації, і я думаю, у тебе вона така сама, тому я хочу передати слово тобі. Окей, so Аня wants to give the floor uh, to Yuri can tell us more about how he got out of the city and about the mass graves uh, in the city and about how our, our army, Ukrainian army, is uh, trying to protect uh, the Mar- Mariupol. Um, okay, hello everyone. Um, so uh, there is uh, nothing that I can add. So it's something that uh, uh, Anna has said everything. Um, And uh, uh, personally, I fled uh, from Mariupol uh, using my father's car. I persuaded him, uh, persuaded my parents to go because they didn't want to go. They didn't want to, they wanted to stay in their apartment. And I was uh, lucky to flee. Sorry, I didn't prepare prepare any speech, and maybe uh, someone has uh, uh, questions about uh, my. May... It's okay. It's okay. Mm-hmm. May I add? Actually, not add, but ask because Anna mentioned about uh, 2014. I guess most of you like do not hear what was in Mariupol in 2014 or just hear partly. Uh, so Yuri, maybe you could tell more what is in 2014 and how it was different from 2022. Uh, well, it was completely different and before uh, it uh, started, I didn't expect it would be so serious <clears throat> because uh, uh, as uh, Anna has said, we uh, get accustomed to uh, constant explosions. Uh, we had already been shelled before, so, and it was uh, something habitual for us. Uh, but and uh, when the war started on 24th, 24th of February, it was uh, this uh, sound, uh, these uh, explosions, uh, these uh, sounds of uh, shelling, it was something habitual and it was far away from our houses and that's why we didn't uh, consider it to be so serious. So we underestimated the risk or the risks of uh, staying in our city. Thank you, Yuri. And please don't worry about any prepared speeches. You are free to share anything that's on your mind. Um, we're grateful that you are safe. Um, Can you clarify if your parents left with you? Are they safe too? Mm-hmm. And I asked about um, about people who died, but um, um, 
we were not able to bury them because so uh, we couldn't get to the cemetery to the graveyard so it was impossible to uh, get to the cemetery in a safe way so and that's why uh, the most of people uh, uh, who died they uh, remained laying uh, lying on the ground because uh, we couldn't get to the cemetery to the graveyard it wasn't safe Thank you for sharing, Yuri. Thank you for sharing. I guess if anyone has any comments or questions in response to what we are hearing, um, is that possible? Anna, Danke, Valeria, do you want people to ask questions or to make comments? How would you like to handle this part? Uh, so uh, if someone wants to ask some questions, uh, I don't know about Anna, but I can I can tell about me. If someone wants so, to know some details, maybe they want to clarify some facts, so, so feel free to ask, even if you think that your questions are inappropriate or maybe in some way offensive. So you feel free to ask. Thank you very much, Yuri. So the floor is, is open. If anybody has a question or a comment. Yuri, if I may just ask, are your parents safe? Uh, yes, uh, they are safe. We are living in uh, Zaporozhye, so it's the, it's the Ukraine city, and we are safe. Okay. Relatively thank safe. Relatively, thank you. Please, the floor is open. Any questions anybody might have? And Yuri has said you shouldn't worry about whether it's an ins insensitive question. You shouldn't worry about that. So please, if you have any questions or comments, the floor is open. Well, Yemi, as I said, this this meeting will be tough. I, I guess we there there was a lot of uh, hard hard to spring out the chat yak Buddha. Like to consume. Yeah, th this information, and I believe this is the reason why no no one no, nobody had have, have questions. Yeah, you're right. It's not easy. Um, okay, thank you. We have our hands from Chantel and Sarah. So Chantel and then Sarah, please proceed. Hi, Danka. Hi, Alexandra, Oksana, Valeria. I hope you guys are well. Um, I just definitely it's a lot to process and um, I just want you guys to know that we're here for you. And I guess what I wanted to ask is, um, you know, as as your friend, how would you want us to show up for you? Um, I know you guys, you know, we're asked, uh, we're sharing resource, uh, like sites for resources for donations, but on a personal level, as your friend, how would you want us to show up for you? Is there anything that you want us to maybe be checking in on you guys with? Um, would you want us to be doing something more of this or less of that? Like on that level, what can we do to show that we're here for you or what would you need from us most? May I say? Uh, well, uh, as Danka said on the presentation, uh, the support of our army is truly important for us and actually uh, well, I, I, I speak only for myself right now, but um, when I uh, know that uh, once a week I have a meeting with my international UPG family, I know that I do something for our victory. Uh, I truly, uh, I donate to our army. I try to do my best and I'm trying to keep 
myself safe. Um, I left my home because it was dangerous and uh, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the reasons was that I didn't want uh, to, uh, to evacuate when it will be too late because then our soldiers can uh, uh, help. Suffer. Yeah, can, can suffer saving me from this danger place. So I, I tried to, uh, to, to uh, sorry, I, I forgot every English words. <sighs> okay. <laughs> um, and uh, the fact that I am here, I am here for me, it is the sign that I do everything that I can. Uh, I, I donate, I speak, uh, I try to share the information and uh, everything that we showed on the slide, uh, the way of uh, how you can support us. Uh, uh, believe me, uh, there were much more ways, ways uh, different, different ways to support us, but we collect the most important ones. So if you open the presentation, so you will see what is the most important. Thank you. Uh, oh, uh, I want to like tell, <laughs> but so Chantal, it's like personal for you <laughs> because I'm really happy to hear you. It's like not direct answer to your question, but I just, um, during this day, I just imagine uh, how after Ukrainians' victory, I will hug my friends, <laughs> all my friends who are like moved um, from Ukraine, uh, with whom I meet in different projects and something like that. And Chatel, <laughs> I really want to hug you. <laughs> yeah, so I hope one day it will be. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah, I believe you're next. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Alexandra, Oksana, Danka, and everyone else for sharing. Uh, I must say I'm really impressed how about your capability to, to report and share your stories, because I can only imagine a little bit how you must feel and I I don't think I would be able like you to to talk about all this so so openly and in such a yeah such an, uh, an impressive impressive way so thank you for for sharing with us um I was wondering if you um are happy to share if you're still able to keep in touch with family and friends in Ukraine and uh, in particular in areas like Mariupol that seem to be really cut off from, from the world. Thank you. Valeria, I guess you can answer the question. Yeah, like was it a specific um, question uh, to, to people from Mariupol or like for, for, for all of us? Well, Ukraine and to people, to your friends and family in Ukraine in general, but yeah, in particular, Mariupol, given the, that the situation seems to be particularly bad there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I can answer for myself. I moved to Poland um, last Sunday uh, and I can keep in touch with my family. But the thing is that Ukraine is one of the biggest countries in Europe and it's, it's really wide, it's really big and um, like there, there are different, um, so there, there are active um, fights uh, in some um, areas of Ukraine, and there is um, not relatively safe in 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 other places in Ukraine. Uh, I live in western part of Ukraine, so it's kind of considered to be the safest part of Ukraine right now. And yeah, we do have the connection, we do have networks, so I can. Um, easily um, talk with my friends and, and relatives. But the things are different in, in different places. 
Yes, and now I'd like to add that, as as you heard Anna said, that there is no connection with Mariupol, so they cannot uh, call if uh, to their relatives if they are there. As for me, I now currently I have connection with my with my family. Uh, luckily, today I try I tried to call my close colleague, but unfortunately I couldn't. Uh, well, her phone is uh, switch off, I guess, and uh, I <laughs> I'm pretty nervous because she is in pretty dangerous uh, uh, place. Uh, so. Uh, but for, with the most uh, friends and colleagues and family, well, we have connection, but, and, but we're still in Ukraine. Thank you. What? see your hand yes <clears throat> i want to say thank you everybody um that that was really emotional story emotional meeting for me also um, as a russian my heart uh, just break in twain because um, <clears throat> um i know that we before have no good relationship I mean, Russians and Ukrainians, all these eight years. I'm from um, Ufa. It's uh, one of Russian cities. And uh, last year, uh, I work on uh, international um, UFFE uh, meeting. So it was sport event. And um, uh, I know the delegation from Ukraine come to my city so i have opportunity to speak with them and uh, it's really good people um, i think that we become friends so even in this sphere russian and ukraines become friends and um, on 24 uh, of february um, i just get up with uh, this news and i realize that worlds are divided on two parts even in our relationship, in a uh, relationship between our countries, I mean, Russia and Ukraine. And um, all I want, all just I want to say, uh, please divide um, normal Russians and, uh, and other Russians. Because uh, some people in Russia don't want a war, but uh, as you know, you know everything, you know everything. And um, uh, sometimes we have to be silent. I mean, Russians, we have to be silent because um, in nowadays it will be really dangerous for us to uh, speak the truth. I mean, if you will tell some truth, you will be terrorist or separatist or someone. Um, thousands of Russians uh, um, get prisoned after the demonstration against the war. Thousands. It's even thousands in Russia. We're all watching you. Uh, uh, a lot of Russians watching the news from Ukraine because we have a lot of relatives. Uh, even my friends got relatives on Ukraine. And um, it's, it's not easy. Yes. Millions are silent, yes, millions are silent. So that's why I'm here. And uh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say uh, I'm with you guys, yes. Thank and, you. Uh, yes. Finally, finally, what I want to say, uh, it will be ends, yes. Sometimes it will be ends. And I want, uh, I hope to see that one day we will be friends again. Maybe one day, maybe. 10 years later, but we will be friends again. Thank you, Murat. All right, that's taken some courage from you as well. Thank you. Um, I can see my Ukrainian sisters want to respond. I'm going to ask them to hold their peace for a split second. Murat, you didn't order the invasion, okay? You didn't. That's true. 
So nothing is against you. In addition, you haven't chosen to be silent. You've chosen to come here and you've actually chosen to speak. So thank you. That takes quite a lot of courage. Um, but I'm sure my sisters from Ukraine will respond shortly. Maybe it's also a good time for us to hear, I promised at the beginning of the conversation that we would hear also from His Excellency, the President of Ukraine, to hear an extract, it's about two minutes, of his remarks to the Security Council of the United Nations. Okay, so again, like everything in this conversation, there are some images that you may want to look away from, but it's short, it's two minutes, and it's a summary of what he shared with the Security Council of the UN. The floor to His Excellency, Mr. Volodymyr Zelensky, the President of Ukraine. Vladimir Zelensky, speaking to the UN Security Council, seemed at times as if he himself could barely believe the cruelty. Some people were shot on the streets, he said, limbs cut off, throats slashed, civilians crushed by tanks for the pleasure of Russian soldiers. Zelensky was describing the atrocities the world has now seen from Bucha. And to underline the horror for the Security Council, he offered this gruesome video with its sobering soundtrack. Women were raped and killed in front of their children, he said, some with their tongues having been torn out. Condemnation was fierce and widespread. I will never forget the horrifying images of civilians killed in Butcher. The United States has assessed that members of Russia's forces have committed war crimes in Ukraine. Zelensky demanded as forcefully as ever that Russia be stopped and held to account. Has the time of international law ended, he said? If the answer is no, then action is needed now. The real question for the Security Council is what can it actually do? As a permanent member, Russia has veto power on effectively anything. Russia's ambassador to the UN labeled Zelensky's words lies. The Ukrainians, he said, are killing their own people. For now, from the West, more sanctions, including the US and others now banning all new investments in Russia, with Vladimir Zelensky meanwhile predicting more atrocities are yet to be discovered. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. All right, thank you very much. Um, I know some people joined in a bit later, so you may have missed the presentation from the Ukrainians. They did cover the, the massacre and the atrocities in Bucha um, from a different perspective, but really the same conclusion. I'm not sure what other strong words need to be said, but it's not acceptable. It's not acceptable. And it's not enough for us to sit down and wait for it to pass. That is death in itself. What on earth do we stand for if as a global community, our only action on this is to wait for it to pass? That's not enough. We have to stand with Ukraine. I've said this from the very first moment I opened my mouth. We have to enforce the peace. It's not good enough to tell the Ukrainians that we support you. Keep fighting. That's not good enough. If two of your family members are fighting, do you stand on the side and tell the one that's smaller to keep, keep up the good fight against the bigger one? Does anybody here do that? Does it make sense? Russia is one of the biggest countries in the world, geographically, economically, army, 
almost anybody in Russia fights will be smaller. And here they are fighting Ukraine. And we watch and say, good job, Ukraine. We, we, we support you. That is shameful. That is not humanity. It is shameful. And the excuse that if we intervene, we will start the Third World War is a moral failure. It's a lack of courage. That war has already started. If there's anything we can do, we need to spread this message. If you stand in between two family members fighting, you are not declaring war. You are simply enforcing the peace. If Russia wants to negotiate, that's fine. But negotiate without bombing anybody. We can close the airspace. We can stop the fighting. We are not declaring war. Why are we so afraid? History will not be kind to us. You know how we all look back at World War I and World War II, and we have thoughts and we write essays about the people of that time and the leaders of that time. They will look back to us. And as much as we feel we're doing so much with the sanctions, and the sanctions, they are unprecedented. It's not enough. You don't watch two members of your family fighting and you stand on the side. The morally correct thing to do is to stand in the middle and you enforce the peace. You say you stop fighting. This is not complicated. If we treat them like our family members, if you believe the Russians and the Ukrainians are family members, that's exactly what you would do. That we don't do that is a moral failure. We need to spread the message. We have to enforce the peace. As much as Murat and many others here wish for a better time when we'll be friends again, the possibilities at that time will really depend on what we do now. You understand? You think the Ukrainians would want to be friends with anybody who ignored them? You think they want to spend time with people who were silent while they were being killed? The possibilities at that time depend on what we do now. We are all busy. I love that you've all made the time to be here. Thank you. Let's continue to stand with Ukraine. Let's continue to be united for Ukraine, even if it's just social media posts. Obviously, I understand that the hands are tied of our Russian brothers and sisters. So if you can come here and join us in this safe space, that's something. But for everybody else, it's not acceptable to listen to our world leaders tell us that they cannot intervene. That is not acceptable. You know, we're all intelligent people. So are these leaders. But there is something that happens with the human brain. Once you go down a certain path, it's very hard to take a few steps back. And they've decided that an intervention is war. You know who told them that? The Russian president. He said, if you intervene, it's war. But what else is he supposed to say? You think he respects them for not intervening? Anybody here think he respects them? What would he do if he was on the other foot? He would definitely intervene. We're not asking for a declaration of war. We're asking that we find the courage to enforce the peace. And I want to ask you to please join. So when you post hashtag United for Ukraine, please add the hashtag enforce the peace. When history looks back, 
history will not comprehend why we watched our brothers and sisters being killed. The other thing that the Russian president has already said is that all of these sanctions are tantamount to a declaration of war. So we are not afraid to declare war via sanctions, but we are afraid to close the airspace. I know one day they will find a way to save their faces, but this is a failure. We have to close the airspace. We have to enforce the peace. It's not enough to tell the Ukrainians we admire them, we love them, they're such great champions for democracy, and we are watching. This is shameful. It is shameful. It is shameful. Unfortunately, I do not control an army, but I do know good people, you. So please spread the word. People need to start thinking differently. Enforcing the peace is not the same as declaring war. And we have the power. We have the power to enforce the peace. There are many countries alone that can do that. And collectively, we definitely can. NATO, the EU, collectively we can. Um, all right, these are some of my thoughts. I do know that um, we need to close soon, but as is our tradition, please, the floor is open before we close for any thoughts, any reactions to anything that's been shared. Please, Danka, you've got the mic, and then Valeria, but anybody can speak. I give, I give Valeria the first floor. Then I... Okay, Valeria, please go on. Okay, thank you. First of all, thank you, Yemi, uh, as usual, for your strong words, for your strong opinion. And you are absolutely correct that people cannot stand aside and people cannot just watch and think that, you know, it will, it will pass. It will not if the world won't react. But I just want to add you and just say that um, it's not acceptable for Russians as well to stay silent. Uh, people in Ukraine, in the occupied territories, are... Um, going on the protests, they are uh, going to Russian soldiers and tell them that they are occupiers. They go on the protest despite the fact that they might be shot on the protest while Russians are being afraid of getting into prison for 15 days or you know, paying a fine. So uh, you know, saying that Russians are in the hard situation too and that they, you didn't say that. You know, it's just about saying, uh, uh, you know, considering what Murat has has told, um, Ukrainians here are suffering, not Russians. There is, uh, there must be a a reaction for every action, and what Russians are doing is unacceptable uh, in our land. And when Russians are doing in their country, being silent, being ignorant, is also uh, is is also a bad thing. So that is my point. Thank you, Valeria. I agree with you. And again, this is why we come together. Sometimes some things are not clear, right? For one person and somebody else shines a light on it. So I agree with Valeria. Yes, I did say it's probably very dangerous for Russian. And maybe I have a, a bigger tolerance for that silence. But Valeria has pointed out that actually, no, they shouldn't be silent. At this time, they should also take risks. Um, so thank you, Valeria. Danka, you've got the mic. And anybody can speak up, please. You just put your hand up and you get the mic. Danka? Yeah, uh, thank you, Yemi. Actually, I think uh, this word with, uh, which Valeria said, uh, this word represent like um, uh, point of view of most of Ukrainians now that like uh, each Russians is responsible for that. Uh, but like, um, um, I don't know, Murat, I have like rhetorical question for you, like just, rhetor and just rhetorical and I'm not sure if you understand me correctly. Um, I just want to say that um, Okay, um, not going to the rallies, um, 
Okay, there is like some positions of Russians which do not go to rallies and something like that, but um, I recommend you just think about your country. These rallies, uh, like it's like my personal point of view, it's not rallies for like war, it's not rallies to not only rallies to support Ukraine. It's like rallies um, to establish democracy in your country. And um, yeah, it's rhetoric, it was rhetorical questions. And the thing, do you want to live in such country which you have now? Uh, do you want your child, uh, that your children will live in such country? It's like, for me, it's like, be a child of Hitler. Sorry for that, but it's like my personal point of view. Thank you, Danka. No need to apologize. This is a safe space. Hi, Judith. And welcome again. Welcome back. Hi. You've got Annie. the floor. Thank you very much. Um, I think the thing that I find so frustrating about um, global reaction and especially on the part of the US, which is where I am, is that we seem to have this delusion that if we just hold, hold him back just enough, that we'll be safe, that it will end here, that he will stop with Ukraine. In my view, he will not stop with Ukraine, he will not. And we're not safe. When, when there is that much power, malevolent power concentrated, it's never been, it's never been the world's experience that they are willing to stop with this much it's going to be this much and then it's going to be this much. So I think that um, the U.S. has long had a, a really sort of blind delusional attitude that somehow we can keep ourselves safe. But there is, there is no safety in standing on the sideline. There isn't. There never will be. So that's all I wanted to say. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think there's also a hope that somehow, somehow this will go away and we would have gotten through it without expanding ourselves too much. I see a bit of that in the global reaction, maybe also in the US reaction. And I think as someone here has already said, this will not go away unless we act, this will not go away. Um, um, thank you. Thank you very much. I sometimes wonder if there's something they are not telling us. Is there something they are not telling us? We know they are interdependencies, whether it's gas or oil, but surely all of that isn't worth the principles of the world in which we want to live in, the freedoms that we are breathing, the fact that we can talk, the fact that the US government can sit and have a conversation, all of that is a result of freedoms that people died for. The fact that the EU can sit today and talk as independent nation to another independent nation, people died for those freedoms. And so it's not about, I don't know what they're not telling us, whether it's gas or oil or some trade or some other interest, all of that is not as important as what our ancestors died for. <laughs> it's not. So again, my only explanation is the Russian president said, if you intervene, there will be World War III. 
which he should say. And they decided in that moment to go down that path. And with the way human beings think and behave, once you're down a path, it's really hard. You try to justify it. You try to show that that was the right decision. But history has shown us, as many people here have said, that's not the right decision. We are not going to have the outcome we want until we have the courage to act. And that action is to enforce the peace. He doesn't respect them and he never will unless they show that they can also stand and die for what we claim to believe in. This is really shameful that we are watching what's happening in Ukraine. And I really hope, and I pray for those who are prayerful amongst us, I ask you to pray because there's only really two people who can intervene here in a big way. One of them are all these nations with their armies. And I guess the other one is God. In the meantime, what can we ordinary people do? Well, we can try to nudge our nations with their armies and we can pray to God. We shouldn't be silent. We should do our maximum. And if you're wondering if all of this, if you're wondering if all of this is too much, I want you to picture for a moment that you are Ukrainian, if you're not. I want you to imagine for a moment that this is happening to your country. Even if you're Russian, I want you to imagine that this was happening to your country. You would absolutely want the world to stop and fix this. We can't go from day to day watching the news, treating this like it's normal. This is not normal. And sanctions alone are a moral failure. This nobody here would see this happening in real life, two members of your family fighting, and you would stay on the side. I don't think anybody here would do that. Nobody here would stand in a park and see a bully attacking another family. Nobody here would say, but that other family is not my family, so I'm going to stay here. I don't think anybody here would do that. If you're in a park and a bully attacks another family, you would move in, right? I remember a very trivial example. When I studied in the USA at Harvard University, it was one evening I was going to see a friend. I left my building block and I was going to see a friend and I heard the voice of a woman. I thought she was laughing. But then it rang out again and I thought that's strange. So I stopped and I listened and she wasn't laughing. She was crying. You could hear she was crying. I obviously did something, but I'm not stupid. The guy could have been twice my size. So the first thing I did was I walked straight to the street and I asked people to please come with me that there's a woman being beaten. Most people walked past me. I kept trying to stop people. The way I got help was fortunately I saw a group of three men and one woman walking. So I ignored everybody now and I walked straight to them. And I used something I learned from the dance floor. And I spoke to the woman. I told the woman what was happening and I told her she needed to tell her three male friends to follow me. When I was done, she didn't even say anything. She just did this. And the three men followed me and we went to the door and we banged on the door. The guy opened it. He was bigger than me, but there were four of us. So he wasn't going to do anything. And we told him, I said, we hear a woman crying, is she safe? And he said, yes, she's safe. 
And I said, sorry, we need to see her. And he showed us her and I said, can she come outside? And he said, no. I said, well, we're not going anywhere until she comes outside. She came outside. Now, it shocked me because a lot of the neighbors did nothing. This is in the USA. But one neighbor called the police. So by the time we got this woman downstairs, the police had arrived and they arrested this man. It's a whole separate story. But the point I want to make is we can all do something. And you can't say I'm too small, I don't have an army, I don't have a voice. We can all do something. Staying silent is not acceptable. And in this situation, cheering the Ukrainians is not enough. Sanctions are not enough. We have to find the courage to enforce the peace. I don't understand watching CNN and BBC, why these journalists are not repeating to the politicians, why are you not enforcing the peace? That is the only question they should be asking. Nothing else. Nothing else. Why are you not enforcing the peace? These journalists, they have press freedom in these countries, rights that people died for. Freedoms that Russian journalists don't have. So th there is really no other question they should be asking other than why are you not closing the airspace? Why are you not enforcing the peace? Are we saying the blood that we have is not, is what, it's too expensive to shed blood for the lives of Ukrainians? Is that what we're saying? That's shameful. Because in the same breath, we declare Ukrainians champions of democracy. In the same breath, we see how much we admire Ukrainians. Those are empty words. We don't know which Ukrainians will be killed tomorrow. And I, I grieve not just for Ukrainian children and women. I grieve for Ukrainian soldiers. They didn't ask for this war. They didn't invade anybody. They shouldn't be dying. This is not acceptable. And I pray, I know you're all here because you're affected and you should know you're not the only ones affected, but I pray and I act, we need to help the world find the courage to intervene. That has to happen. It's either going to be through the armies of these nation states or God is going to do something. Something has to happen. This is not acceptable in any way. And silence is not acceptable. Please don't just go about your business. Make it your business to post hashtag enforce the peace, hashtag united for Ukraine. And even if it's just once a week, we come together here, make it your business to be here. Please, something has to change. And as ordinary people, this is us doing our part. So I want to say a big thank you. As usual, I want to give the last word to our Ukrainian brothers and sisters before we close. So if there's anything you want to say before we close, you've got the mic. So Valeria, Anata, Oksana, Alexandra, Danka, if there's anything you want to say, you've got the mic. I don't know who yeah. wants to go. Can I speak? Yes. So first I wanted to thank you, Yami, for this event as usual. And I also wanted to thank everyone who joined us. It is really important. It is important to speak. It is important to not stay silent. Um, I wanted to ask you when you can, please spread the truth, spread the real information. Uh, ask your friends to donate, to donate to our incredible armed forces of Ukraine, because they are who stand between your children and the horrors Russia creates in Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you, Oksana. Thank you. Thank you, Yemi. If you let me, I have a few words to say. Uh, uh, Judith, I appreciate your your words. You are told that they won't stop, and you know that uh, such countries as Poland, Estonia, and Lithuania they already understand that they won't stop, and they preparing 
Well, as uh, if you watch the news, you know that they are preparing. They understand the danger. They understand the threat. The threat. And for those who are silent, especially in Russia, I can say only that Russian population is 140 million millions inhabitant. If all of those so-called normal Russians, if they are existing in Russia, if you stand up and say the thing that you think, if you won't be silent, you will kick off all your authorities and all uh, FSB, I don't know how to translate it to uh, English, but I believe that our Russian uh, UPG uh, member will understand it. You will kick them off. We pay a huge price while the world watching, as Yemi says. Our soldiers, they are our angels. We admire them. And the only uh, I, I don't know the only thing why we don't say about them because I guess it's because we afraid uh, to think how many of them had already died. How many of them have, were already killed. Our every, every uh, Ukrainian have brother, husband or father who is fighting for our freedom who is fighting for democracy, for, for democracy in the whole world. And they are our angels. And again, Yemi, I'm, I really appreciate that you give us this opportunity to speak, to, to spread the truth. So, so that it, it's not uh, our, our uh, it's not hundreds of uh, uh, people's audience, but it, I believe that those who came here, they are truly that people who are able to act, who are able to fight for democracy, for the democracy with us and to change this world, to make it truly a better place, as the UPG says. Thank you, Yemi, for this. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you. Thank you, Yemi. Thank you, everyone. If you allow me, I will be the next one. You know, during this war, when it started, I always feel that I'm in a safe place, but I do not do enough. I mean, enough, like everything enough. Yes, like I'm not fighting. I'm in a safe place and sometimes I feel guilty for it. And I'm just trying to say to myself that like, no, you are safe, but for example, at least you can donate or at least you can inform others about the situation. And uh, this session, this event, which UPG provide us uh, really helped me to understand that I'm doing right. I'm doing at least my best together with uh, the ladies from Ukraine, together with those who attend the sessions. I can inform like uh, my army is like Facebook and Instagram, that's all I have, yes, but uh, there is um, my field where I'm fighting at least, so it helps a lot, and uh, at least we have this war routine every Wednesday, but it's very useful for us, it's very um, grateful, so thank you very much for this opportunity, and I'm really glad to be a part of it, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Vanta. I'll be just brief and short. Thank you for your support and stand with Ukraine. Do, have, do something for Ukraine every day. Thank you, Valeria. Thank you. I just, uh, okay, actually, um, actually, I'm really thank you for all who come here. Mm especially people whom I know personally. And for me, um, it means that you support like not only me, like not only care about me, but care about whole my country. And um, 
I understand that um, I really don't want to do something that um, something that happened now in Ukraine will never happen again. And I don't know if it would be successful from my point or not. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Danke. Thank you. Um, Murat, you want to say something? Please proceed. Yes. Um, you asked me some kind of rhetorical question, and I've got one answer for it. Uh, you asked me why 100.45 million people stay in home and um, just nothing to do. Uh, I've got one answer because I live there 20 years. I'm 20 years old and I'm journalist in uh, my city. I work in media uh, on uh, two years. I work on governmental TV. And after that, I decided to become um, a little bit independent because I understand what's going on in Russia. And um, that's why uh, two weeks ago, I saw the statistics, uh, how many people support uh, the military operation, we call it military operation on Ukraine. It's about 80% of Russians, they are support of Putin's military in Ukraine. And uh, that's why uh, the people stay. But as journalists, as people who works uh, on TV, I know it's because uh, we have only governmental TV and they tell us noodles, we eat them. We eat these noodles, we eat this truth that they show us, that they translate to us. And all independence media, like new newspaper, uh, Rain uh, TV, they leave Russia and they stop uh, their work in Russian Federation. Uh, you know that. And today we have only governmental TV and most, uh, for most population of Russia watching TV, watching governmental TV. And uh, they believe all that they said. They said, uh, Ukrainian Nazis, they believe it because it's just circle. It's kind of circle. Thank you, Moran. Yes. Thank you, Moran. All right. Unfortunately, Russia's invasion of Ukraine continues. And so our work is not done. Please let's continue to be active. Our Ukrainian family has shared with us many ways to be active. And for those of us who enjoy the freedom to be able to speak where we live or to use social media where we are, please let's use it. And if you have access to anybody with authority, please use that access. Um, so I want to say thank you. We will meet again. So if you click on the RSVP link, you will already be able to RSVP. You will already be able to RSVP for next week. Please, as a very minimum, let's come together. Like I said, in one of our earliest weeks, this really affects me and it helps me to spend time with you at the very minimum, because I see other people who it truly affects. So as a very minimum, we help each other be strong. I've posted the link where you can already RSVP. I want to say a special thank you to Danka, Alexandra, Oksana, Nata, Valeria. It's such a privilege to know you. You are real ambassadors of Ukraine. Um, the way you use your voice, the fact that you try very hard to be balanced. Many of us couldn't do that when our homes are under attack, when our very identity is under attack. You would be forgiven for not being balanced. Because Russia has said things that almost challenge the very existence of Ukraine. So you will be forgiven, but you find the courage to be as balanced as is 
humanly possible. So thank you. We love you very much and we are with you. And thank you for everything you're sharing. We will act as you have suggested. We will continue to convene. And, and we know that these actions will be part of the solution. Even if it just helps us all to find something we can do, even if it just helps us all to cope, even if it just helps us all to find each other, hopefully after Ukraine has won, hopefully after the world has intervened. Okay, but thank you so much for your own contributions. We look forward to seeing you soon. Please continue to stay safe. We are praying for you. We are praying for Ukraine. We are united for Ukraine. Um, I want to bring this to a close, our traditional way. Um, for the first time, we listened to the voice of a very young girl singing the Ukrainian national anthem. And we will invite her once again to help us close. So if you are willing and able to stand, please do. We listen to Amelia Anisovich as she sings the Ukrainian national anthem. Please let me know if you can hear it. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, hopefully, we'll see you next week. We'll leave to something upbeat that was done for Ukraine. Those of us who know old music. Cave calling. Cave calling. Those of us who know old music will remember a hit done by The Clash called London is Calling. And so a modern band has made this hit called Kiev is Calling. Thank you so much, everybody. Stay safe.